Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Again, my name is Abir Rahim Mohammed, founder and president of the Hung Tao Choi May Leadership Institute. We want to welcome you to U Street and to the historic Lincoln Theater, one of its great cultural treasures. U Street was once referred to as the Black Broadway, and there's an old saying that before there was Harlem, there was U Street. And for the past 10 years, U Street has been a home to the Hung Tao Choi Mae Leadership Institute, one of the most highly regarded and recognized traditional martial arts organizations in the United States. So welcome to U Street, one of the nation's great historical places. Tonight, ladies Tonight, ladies and gentlemen, we're honoring Dick Gregory, one of the great masters of the 20th century. Dick Gregory, like Paul Robeson, speaks truth to power in an uncompromising manner. And also like Paul Robeson, makes no separation between his work as an artist and his work as a human being. Paul Robeson once said, he who is not prepared to face the trials of battle can never lead to victory. For over 50 years, Dick Gregory, at great sacrifice, has placed his tremendous talent in service to humanity, never asking for thanks or expecting a reward, only seeking direction to the front line of where the next battle is to be fought. With Dr. King, he marched, marched in Birmingham. At a time, the place was so dangerous, they nicknamed it Bombingham. He fasted over a month to protest the Vietnam War and again to protest the treatment of Native Americans. He slept in parks and other drug-infested areas to fight against drug addiction and distribution. He continues to use all of his talents and resources to improve the plight of the less fortunate among us. Dick Gregory, a true hero, is a reminder to all of us that the voices of Paul Robeson, Dr. Du Bois, Martin and Malcolm, Fannie Lou, Rosa, and Coretta have not been silenced, nor their works forgotten. And the march towards progressive fundamental change in the society continues on. Before we give way to Brother Baraka, we would like to mention a thing or two about the Hung Tao Choi Mae Leadership Institute. Our organization has been described in the press as a hidden gem on New Street. We use the intense training and a Kung Fu training to develop in our students physical strength, a quickened mind, and an ethical and moral base to judge their own actions as well as those of others. These are difficult and challenging times for all of us, but especially for our youth. And through the Leadership Institute, we provide inspiration and motivation for meeting many of life's tough challenges. We're like a life raft thrown out to our youths floundering about in the midst of stormy seas. And you would be surprised at how many adults need a, a life raft as well. How many adults need discipline, a fitness program, and a time set aside for meditation and self-examination. <laughs> Training at the Hung Tao Choi Mei Leadership Institute, as our motto states, is preparation for living a meaningful life. We're also preparing our students for any hardship or catastrophe. And they're coming. So if they're in the position of those who were deserted and neglected in New Orleans, they will not sit around and wait for the incompetent or the indifferent, but will use their training to secure safety for themselves and others in danger. Our students will not wait on others to come and do for them what they're being trained to do for themselves, and that is survive, thrive, and prosper. Finally, we would like to thank all of our hardworking instructors and students of the Hung Tao Choi Mei Leadership Institute that gave up their time and energy to make this event possible. We're extremely grateful 
to the many great artists here tonight, in addition to Mr. Gregory, who are responsible for this extraordinary event. Amiri Barak, Dr. Manning Morrow, Kevin Maynard, Dr. Raymond Jackson, Ayanna Gregory, thank you all so very much. We would also like to extend our thanks to our many wonderful contributors to our event program. Dr. Mark Nason, Mr. William Katz, and Ms. Esther Jackson, the former editor of Freedom Ways magazine. Thank you. I want to talk about Paul Robeson a little bit. Uh, first of all, because like my wife and myself, Robeson uh, was accused of being a communist. <laughs> and uh, not only are we accused of being a communist, but we actually are. <laughs> hey, but I don't feel no draft. You know, between Paul and Du Bois, I can handle that. But remember, Robeson's parents were slaves. They escaped slavery and escaped to New Jersey. New Jersey was a place that had a lot of stations on the Underground Railroad. You know, in fact, there's a town in New Jersey which was once called Timbuktu. It's now called Lawnside. How it got to be Lawnside? Well, how did these Negroes who started out militant get to be Lawnside? <laughs> Actually, Paul was the third black student at Rutgers University. Rutgers is still a racist joint. I mean, I, they kicked me out in 1990. I was a professor. But all I said was, why don't you teach something about the Western world, you know? Uh, but. Paul was the third black to go there. He was a call, he was a football player, basketball player, baseball player. Uh, when he first tried out for the football team, they broke his wrist. They put him in such a state that he couldn't uh, play for the first month or so. He got so bad he wanted to quit. His father told him he better not quit. And so Paul Robeson became the first and only All-American <laughs> at Rutgers football player. He was a Phi Beta Kappa. He finished as the valedictorian of his class. That's why we call him the tallest of trees. And so when he came out, and Rutgers tried to make believe he wasn't there for many years, and that they actually uh, uh, you know, what they do, what they call that thing where they actually sandblasted or something like they put his picture out of the, uh, you know, graduation picture. But when Paul got out of Rutgers, he wanted to be a lawyer. And that credo, it's interesting that he and Du Bois had a similar kind of credo. With, with, with uh, Paul it was, I know that I have to help my less fortunate brothers we are a less fortunate race, and it is my task to help raise our people. See, I wish more of you young people now had that view. Yeah. Our son, Raz Baraka, who is now a councilman in Newark, running for re-election, he had that kind of feeling, that kind of credo, that my information, the knowledge, the skills that I have will be used to raise my people. Otherwise, what is it? What is it good for? So he became a lawyer, but he found he couldn't deal with downtown Wall Street lawyers. He found that they were the most racist scoundrels on the planet. And so he had to get out of that. He didn't want to be an actor. He had acted, he had sung. But then he was recruited to play roles, and he discovered the way the audience reacted that maybe that was a better place for him to be. 
that acting, that uh, waging war, if you will, in the place of the mind, waging the war of ideas, actually getting into people's minds. When he went to uh, Europe, England, to act in a role that had something to do with Africa, he sang a song and the people applauded him. He sang it again. They applauded him. He sang it again. He discovered what he could do, that he could raise people. And remember, Paul Robeson was the first concert artist to actually do a program of Black Sorrow songs, the spirituals. He was the one that made the sorrow songs, brought them in to the 20th century, and gave them a stature throughout the world. It was Paul Robeson who did that. And that was before Old Man River. But he was the one who created a uh, black song, you know, every time I get the feeling, you know, deep river, all those songs. Kevin Maynard starts singing those. But remember, Paul Robeson came out of college and into the big world during the Harlem Renaissance, where people like W.B. Du Bois had set the tone. When people like Langston Hughes, Zora Neale Hurston, and Duke Ellington. And it's interesting what Du Bois called the Sisyphus Syndrome, because he meant that, you know, the myth of Sisyphus, we, you know, Sisyphus, of course, he wouldn't die. Then they punished him by making him roll this boulder up this mountain. And then he would roll it back on his head. Du Bois said, that is the black liberation movement. We got out of slavery, we pushed that rock, that 186,000 black people who fought, who were killed and wounded in the Civil War, uh, it was not given to us. We fought for that. And remember, when Paul got out of, uh, 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 of college, it was just 50 years later. You know, it wasn't a long time later that he got out of college. Remember, we've only been free, what is it, since, what is that, 1863? What's that, 100 and what, 40 years or something like that? We were slaves for 200 years. You see, we've been slaves twice as long as we've been free. That's why we don't know how to act, because we know we ain't been free long enough to know how to act. <laughs> Got to put some more time in with freedom, learn what it means. <laughs> but the Harlem Renaissance, where Paul flowered, was the second major rock rolling up the hill. That's what the Harlem Renaissance was. That's what Langston and Zora Neale, and later on, you know, that's when uh, 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 Weldon Johnson did, you know, lift every voice and sing. You know, that's when we began to put our muscles to the stone and push it back up the hill until, of course, the 30s when they brought fascism in. But still, Robeson said, the artist has to make his choice. Either fight for freedom or fight for slavery. There is no neutral idea. An artist is political, even if they say they're not political, they're political. You understand that? Even if you say you're not political, that's a political stance. Because you are taking one philosophy, and whatever you do is pushing that philosophy. So Robeson went out on the limb from the beginning to say, I take my stand. I'm not sneaking around trying to be famous at my people's expense. You know, and that's what's happening now. A Negro like Morgan Freeman say he don't even like Black History Month. Then the next month he appeared as a narrator on it. You understand? That's the kind of prostitutes that we have today. <laughs>